this is dope people. Uh, we just highlight the people that are, are building this industry, the pioneers of dope shit. And um, we're excited for today. We're excited for the event. There's a lot of things going on in the world uh, we'll touch on. But uh, before I do, I want to introduce my co-host, Lulu. Lulu, how are you doing today? Toby, um, everything is good. I got a question for you today. Okay. Um, what's your thoughts on the vaccine? Are you going to be getting poked? <laughs> um. I, I guess I'll admit this publicly. I kind of low key am going to get the vaccine and then not tell certain people in my life that I'm vaxxed. That's how I feel about it. So I can just kind of like use that card later. Um, but the fact that I just said it on this, I might edit it out and then repost <laughs> it on YouTube. <laughs> um, Kobe yeah. is, uh, an extrovert, but an introvert at the same time. <laughs> The people that know me know that very well. Um, yeah, so today, uh, really excited about this episode. We have a, a person that I have known for almost seven years, um, kind of a legend in the, the concentrate making space. And this whole series is about highlighting people that have successfully flipped it from the underground and made it over to uh, the regulated market and somehow are paying taxes on it. Um, really excited about it. But before I do, I just want to shout out the people that have joined in the in the Zoom webinar. You guys can chat us, ask questions as we go. But also shout out to the people that are on YouTube, watching the live stream or watching this later. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, like it, do all that jazz. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Senor Kind Bill, would you mind joining us? What's up, bro? Hey, Jacoby. Hi, Lulu. Hey, Bill. Thank How you. is everybody tonight? Really excited to hear your story. Um, on the concentrate oh, side and um, always just super excited to hear um, from folks that have been, you know, the innovators, the flat, you're the inventor of um, live resin and flash frozen. So super stoked to hear your story. Yeah, so glad to be here and get to share. Yeah, uh, before we hop into your story, Bill, and I, I really want to learn more about it, um, I do want to take a minute to just talk about what's going on in the world. Um, we always do this segment. We normally have Peter join us and do this. He couldn't join us today because doing the family thing. Uh, so I'm going to do my best. And there's one story I want to talk about specifically. There's a couple weighing heavy on my heart that have happened in the last week or so. Um, but this one specifically, it happened a couple of weeks ago, this gentleman named Corvain Cooper, and he has a very powerful story. And if you haven't heard about it, I'm going to just give it a, a quick overview. Um, he basically was locked up in 2013 uh, for life without parole. Uh, the typical three strikes bullshit. Um, he, was, he was in prison in Louisiana, I think, in 2013. And I just think about the timeline of marijuana legalization and how this all happened. 2012, I think legalization passed in Colorado. In 2014, it was operational. And he went in right as this real transition was happening. Seven years, if I'm doing my math right, seven, eight years, he's locked up. And um, thanks to a lot of advocates and, and people working on his behalf that didn't give up, especially uh, this group 40 tons, shout out to them. Uh, he was granted clemency um, by the last administration on their way out. So he, he kind of, you know, he said it's better than the lottery if you, if you go watch his video. Um, so he, he got out, but seven years is no joke. Seven, a seven year sentence, man, you're, you're, you know, you're not the same human. You never are back to there. You know, people talk about a new normal after a year of a COVID lockdown. Imagine every facet of your life being controlled for seven years and being told you're never going to matter again and then trying to reintegrate and reassemble and, and uh show up in your community and, and and everybody's looking at the guy too so it's 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 near and dear to my heart as well i wish that him the best and I, I know there's some opportunity to get some help out there for him too and and uh yeah that's kind of something that that's a big deal about equity is it's got to start with getting these guys out of prison 
and, and we'll get into that more, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah. that's something that's been spinning through my head since we opened this equity conversation, for sure. It really starts with the guys that are still doing, guys and girls that are still doing time. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm really excited to get into to your story and your perspective on this. Uh, before I do, I would just say that there's a GoFundMe for Corvain. And, um, you know, he basically, he got out, he went back to his old neighborhood, right? He has, he has two kids um, before he went in. So he's now trying to get up and get out of that area. So the GoFundMe is to support his integration back in. And I can't imagine what he's going through. To your point, like, he's vocal. He's talking all the time about what's going on. He went from zero to 60, like really being an advocate. So we'll share the link in the webinar and on the YouTube if you want to go support him and in this journey. And honestly, I read somewhere else that there's still 40,000 people that are in prison for cannabis related offenses. And we talk about the business of cannabis all the time, but we can't wow. communicate about it without talking about the real life impact of people right now. Absolutely. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch it up. Uh, shout out to Corvain, shout out to 40 Tons and um, The Last Prisoner Project. Now let's talk about The Legend of Kind Bill. Uh, you have a pretty interesting story, dude. So I've known you, I got to know you seven years ago when I got my first job in, in legal weed. And uh, I just saw this guy go into our back corner of the lab and he was just super particular about every single thing that came out of that lab. Uh, as I got to know him, I realized that it is the legend of kind Bill. Uh, before we get into that and how you mastered your craft, how about you just break it down on how did you even get started? What, what started you on this journey? It was clearly before legalization. Sure. Um, you know, all the way back to the first time that I consumed cannabis, that there was an effect. Uh, pretty much been a, a central point in my life. Really, uh, not, not that I'm an advocate for super young use, but, uh, you know, single mom, going through all the stuff. And I was out there smoking weed when I was 13 and fell in love with it. And then I tried to grow some weed a couple of times when I was 15 and I, and I, and I, and I'm a, I'm a go after something that I want to figure out kind of guy. One thing led to another and I kind of fell in the hands of um, some guys that were smugglers and, and, and fairly decent scale growers in South Florida. And uh, kind of, I lied about how old I was and kind of ran away to join the circus, so, so I say, you know? And that, that's kind of where it started, really at a, at a crazy scale for a kid. Um, something unique about youth, right, is you could really be 10 feet underwater and think that you have water around your ankles. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind of the beginning of it. I. Um, I guess to back up, both my parents are academics at, at a pretty decent level and, and perfectionists in their own crafts. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to be in a, in a discussion uh, uh, about what the good is from an early age. Then that first group that I was with, um, my mentor was, you know, obsessive compulsively perfectionist on the level of insane and that's that may be necessary to not be robbed arrested go to jail as a as a you know smuggler and um through the 70s 80s 90s as, as was his case so so this is in in florida southwest florida what yep. year is this um i met those guys in 1987 uh i met there 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 were two brothers and i met the younger brother and uh that, that's an entire story of itself but it, it, never nevertheless he hadn't really met a young young guy with the kind of go-to that i had and I, I was pretty excitable and enthusiastic as i'm i'm known for but but maybe on a hundred X, right? 
and uh, me and him started kicking around. And about nine months into knowing him, he like took me to a hotel where he brought his brother. I had a two hour conversation with him. Um, he, he, he'd been growing at scale in both Jamaica, Canada and Florida outdoor for over a decade, but had never grown indoor, nor had I mind you, but I'd read some books and uh, I had a good conversation with him and they're like, we want you to come and build out this indoor grow for us and, and uh, put a blindfold on me and put me in the back of the car. So and, you, had you, you're 16, had you grown weed at all? Little bits, like, you know, in the, outside the window, still with my mom's and like okay. on the side of the pond, but I never pulled anything off. I never got any weed out of it. Um, but I'd so read everything that was in print a few times at that point, including all of the um catalogs and everything for all the equipment so i was really well versed with the language of the industry and then the biology side of all everything that was available written okay. and the, the dude was blown away he you know i was 16 he completely believed that i was 19 or maybe he didn't maybe he didn't care but uh i went out there and um yeah, that, that's where it started. I didn't leave the property for six months. Uh, Damn. And I didn't know where that place was until I went out of there in the back of the police car. Really? I thought you had been doing it for a little bit longer. before. Years, years and years. But I always went in and out on a blindfold. That's how tight it was. People don't understand. It's like, you know, oh, wow. in California, you could maybe tell people that you were growing weed at this time uh but man you get life in prison in florida for 30 plants <laughs> yeah it's no you joke thousands at times you know so um april 12th uh 1991 i had just gotten done having my lunch i was having a smoke on the deck and heard a helicopter and knew the second that i heard it that Everything that I knew before was going to have a new reference point. <laughs> and going forward, there was going to be a, you know, an intersection in time where I reference everything and, and that I was about to relearn everything. I just knew how, how low that helicopter was, that bad things were about to happen. So you were yeah. like 26, 25? No, I was uh, 21, not even 20. Yeah. Okay. So you've been doing um, it for like three or four years. Three and a half years out there about. Um, probably the last year and a half before got busted. A lot of, we, we were making some oil in Jamaica and smuggling it. And that was kind of this group's gig previous, but there had been some trouble down there and they had been kind of just, their version of lying, lying low was, you know, growing a thousand pounds of weed a year or something in the swamps so they went um, from smuggling to growing yeah and really, then uh -huh. and then started tiptoeing back into the smuggling okay. um yeah and then uh and, and, and okay so what happened moment. after you saw that helicopter like so a lot a lot, man. I ran, I had plants both indoors and outdoors, and I immediately went into like damage control. I knew they were coming, but I like tried to close the doors on all the outside buildings and knock down plants that they maybe wouldn't have seen yet. And I had thousands of seedlings that were up uh that I kicked all those trays and ditched them and like, you know, phone records, whatever. But it turned into about a nine and a half hour kind of standoff of helicopter on me and SWAT team around the property. Holy they shit. didn't have a search warrant, so I wouldn't let them in. And uh, they were threatening to kill my dogs. And, it, you know, very normal South Florida police handling, you know, long haired kid looking like a hippie out there. And eventually they're like we're gonna kill the we're killing the dogs if you don't let us in so i told them that i would climb over the fence 
and surrender. If they didn't shoot my dogs. So mm -hmm. probably, you know, nine, 10 hours into the thing, I climbed over the fence and then was uh, taken away to, to the sheriff's department while they try to get a warrant and figure out what they're going to do out there. Shit. Okay. This is a lot, actually. You've it's a lot. We've, we've talked about this before this show, and I'm still getting more out of it. This is this is crazy. So helicopters come, you're in a standoff for a while, right? And then all the processing and, and shit happens. So what what ended up being the result or the penalty or the, the situation that came from that? So long, you know, drawn out thing. Uh at the end of it. I ended up serving about four and a half years in and another that on parole, well, a controlled release. That was pretty, pretty stringent, man. I had a uh, 4,000 hours of community service originally. I had, you know, to be in therapy, I had to be in school, I had to be report like six year analysis of a month. Uh, they, they, they were on me. They did not want me to get off parole for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, about two thirds of the way through that, um, my parole officer actually pulled me in and he and I were, were definitely in conflict. Uh, and he was like, Hey, you have family in Colorado. You should probably move there. Uh, if you'd like to get off parole. And they kind of invited me to leave Florida. And I, like, Fuck I, yeah. I complied for sure, man. I got enrolled in school here in Colorado and uh, and came home. So when, when was this? What so time that was 97. I did my last year of parole here. Okay. I got off uh, October of 98. All right. So you, you put in the time, man, both pushing serious weight way before this whole legalization craze you yep. had to serve you served time for four plus years then parole and parole alone the way you've explained it sounded like it was really strict in in florida at least i don't know it was like in colorado yeah it, it, it was not a thing here in colorado but in florida my particular parole officer didn't did did not prefer me and, and, and was looking to catch me and I uh, could be a little smart ass a little bit especially when I know I'm doing it right you know what I mean and a little flaunting and um, but little things that I knew because I'm, I was a little you know it breaks you when they when they lock you up when you're that young a little bit and so you're bucking in every way that you can on the line kind of and so I knew that I could smoke weed on the way to a drug test and it would never be in my pee. But then I had to start flushing right away in mm -hmm. case they're going to test me again. But I'll frequently go in there to, to do my drug test smelling like weed and just smiling at him. And he would just be, I'm sure wanting to, you know, kill me. Damn, if you're playing with fire, you made it yeah, out. You, you, not the way to be not the way to be but that's kind of what happens uh when you're under somebody's thumb is that you tend to want to poke them in the eye if you get a chance yeah um and it took me a long time to get the chip off my shoulder and just want to reintegrate and like be a normal guy that wasn't mad all the time that that that's that's our rebuild process right I, and i was fortunate enough while doing time to have to like to read and that to be my escape me mechanism a lot of people work out play cards whatever but man i just devoured everything i could read and i have pretty just shy of a thousand books throughout the whole, whole ordeal wow M maybe like 300 novels and a lot of trash you know but just whatever is around i read it all and uh then doing federal time being articulate there are a lot of smart guys in there <laughs> you know so i learned uh i learned the commodity futures business and and came out wanting to do that and and just you know they, they wouldn't let me but uh 
I, I got a financial education and uh, made it count. And that's what I tell if I talk to anybody that's going in or is in uh -huh. that you're going to be mad and it sucks, but however you have to survive in there, uh, make it count. Somehow learn, learn something, even if it's about yourself, right? Um, some book that I read along the way is super pertinent, I think, to today. And, and, I, and I, I don't remember the book. I just remember this line from it. But it, it, it said, uh, no man has any measure of his freedom unless he can see the bars of his own cage. And the, the implication is that we're trapped by our ideas long before you could ever put chains on somebody. And so you could, I was as free as I've ever been in prison because I was able to just double down on reading and not let them turn me into a uh, killer savage, whatever thing that that, that machine is, is built to turn people into. That, that is, that's a crazy bar right there. Can you, can you say that again? So, so no man has any measure of his freedom unless he can see the bars of his own cage. And it was in a weird sci-fi novel. I can't remember the name of that I pulled this out of, but I was like, wow, that's super profound, right? Because um, everybody's trapped up by their own ideas of normal and good and bad and, and whatever, right? And, yeah. and, and, and the, the deal is to like dig down on what your bars are and, uh, and, uh, and try to suck a little less a little sooner, like I always say. <laughs> I'm about to have some serious reflection on my life later tonight off of that one. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up. Let's, let's take okay. that. This is your journey, right? Even before you even got to Colorado. And thankfully, you had opportunity, you had family, you, you got a shot to come out here. Um, I, I just know from research that this is where you really start to get into, I'll call it legal, but it's, it's kind of like a spectrum where you went from like the black market to the dark gray market to the gray market. And this is the gray market phase. Sure. Uh, can you talk to me what, what's going on in Colorado and how did you even get involved in that? So like, you know, at that time in Colorado, um, especially I lived in Boulder County in, in, a, in, a, in all the little mountain towns outside of Boulder County, kind of floating around. And you know, that area code on your phone number basically means you're a weed grower in 1998, 99, 2000. And so I, I started helping people out with their groves and getting into the community a little bit. And then also getting on the online community. And uh, the, the, the more seasoned growers, know when they're talking to somebody that knows about growing cannabis and especially that's ever done it in any kind of scale that's run numbers or, or seen weight or whatever you know it, you, you know when you talk to someone who's who's not full of shit and uh that i fell into some little private board groups and behind the scenes and people started sending me clones that were pretty that were pretty held and I started trading clones and just being involved in that online community. Um, and I made some of the best friends of my life through those boards that I still do business with today in the legal market. It's kind of cool. You know, a couple of us transferred through and have, have, have remained pretty relevant. What, um, was this legal? Like, were you worried oh, no. about where you came, like going back to no, this? No, this is like, early medical or even before i think medical passed in 2002 in colorado so on that around that timeline probably before i ever posted a picture on an online forum definitely would have been legal medical at least um and that was terrifying for me man to even go on there first and read it i was like for sure the, the cops were going to be like okay we got one this is one of the real ones because at that point man me getting pulled over for a speeding ticket involved guns and my car getting torn apart 
And when I was still that close to my charge, every law enforcement interaction was was extremely negative. Uh, you know, for example, in 98, I was in a party in Lakewood. They were smoking weed. I was not. And somebody called the cops. The cops come ask everybody for their ID. They run them. They immediately separate me from the group. <laughs> Now the three cops with me in the bedroom, you know, and they got everybody else trying to get them to say that I was the one that brought pot there. Uh, so, so whatever, I, I was terrified to do any of those things, but kind of tiptoed in and was immediately accepted. I'd never gotten to show anybody weed that I grew or talked about it with another grower before then. It was crazy. Well, Bill, just talk to me about the mindset here. Like what even compelled you to mess around with this gray area of legalization after everything you had already gone through like what what was it that drew you into that that risk I couldn't not i couldn't not do it man i uh to be honest as young as i was coming into cannabis the the ability to go into an office and you know i can I perform high and it not be just a cruel, you know, a soul crushing experience for me is, is, is a huge challenge. And so I attempted to work in the mortgage industry off and on for years and I was highly successful, but like I'd make a little bit of money and then not want to work and go then like want to travel and see shows and like, you know, be like a wheat grower. <laughs> And uh, because it was a lifestyle of freedom that drove me into this. And then I got addicted to growing plants. And, and, and it definitely was, oh, there's a freedom thing there. That was the most attractive to me. Which it's really not. You're, you're tied to plants, right? It's a different kind of freedom. You make your own rules and stuff. But you definitely have a job every day of the year. Uh, but um, yeah, it's really hard to... to you know, report to somebody that I may or may not feel that it is my intellectual equal who, who might or might not understand me. <laughs> so, so I, I couldn't not do it. And it was funny because in my previous marriage, the day I got married, I said to one of the people in, in the wedding party, I was like, man, she's never going to let me grow weak. And he looked at me and he was like, this is a bad idea, <laughs> like at my wedding, <laughs> like at the reception, I realized, holy shit, I'm not going to get to grow weed again. And we, we, we were in fact divorced in 11, in, in 11 months. And I was fully growing for weed full time from that minute on. Like even the idea that I could never do it again, probably was like the, the spear in the, in, in that one. Yeah, that got um, you. That got you. That mindset. It did. I was like, oh no. That would be terrible. Uh, All right. Yeah, then, then I started diving in. Okay. So let's, let's talk about uh, how you've honed your craft now. So what I think is interesting now is you're kind of in these message boards. You're a grower that has actually done this at scale, probably more than most people you're talking to in the, in the early days. Um, but you have been able to figure out everything on your own which i think is quite different than like if i want to start a grow today uh -huh. i can google search and find yep. 50 consultants that have a resume that can show me what they're going to get per per light all this shit and you know i can fork over way too much money and be set i i don't think that that was possible for you so how the hell like how do you figure Man. it out that's the it, it's a the hardest thing for me in the switch over into legal was not being able to understand why people couldn't figure things out first and then to back to that like so you can't ask anybody for help right and particularly in florida the um risk of law enforcement super super high but the the maybe higher risk is 
of some organized crime or loosely organized group that they just are in the job of robbing drug dealers, you know, and you get killed by them. They don't come and like, just take your stuff, they kill you. So the security is really high on everything. So you literally might have a broken piece or a missing part of a thing that you don't know what it's called. You have to go to the hardware store and wander around with the thing in your head and then build the solution. And it might take three hours, it might take 20 minutes, but you literally don't know and can't ask and just have to figure it out. And it's plumbing, electrical, security, irrigation, agriculture, pesticides, everything. Like we got these nematodes in the ground there in Florida. And we were like, couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. We had to grow tomatoes in the soil and take it to the ag extension to figure out what was going on. <laughs> but that also took some figuring out. We're like, how can we get know what's going on in our soil? And then we figured out we had a nematode. We, had a, we couldn't use the native soil there without baking it. So um, but I think that's yeah. what kind of sets people like yourself apart because there was there was no resource for you to figure it out. Right, like you literally just had to persist. You, you know, like you'd be yep. wrong, you'd be wrong, be wrong, and it's like I gotta figure this damn thing out. Right, these things are killing my plants. I have to figure it out. And there's no, there's no savior. There's nobody that's gonna come like give you the answer. And I think that's why some people from the underground, like yourself, can build such a great knowledge base of every other all the diversity of elements to grow good weed. Like you mentioned, it's so vast. And I think that's what makes you guys so good is because you had to figure it out. Once you figured out that one time, I'm sure it's stuck. It's not like you're going to forget that again, because you had to spend so much energy to figure it out. Right. And the stakes are real, like your life yeah. and, and, and freedom are at stake all the time. Right. So at least for me, I, it mattered very much that uh, maximum return on every amount of effort, right? Um, because of the exposure. So I was always like, well, if you could grow the same amount of weed, but get twice as much money for it, you'd better be able to get twice as much money for it. You put that work in, you grow the best thing. There, it would be stupid to grow anything that isn't the very best thing ever. And that stuck through with me, obviously, you know? Um, that nothing's good enough, but, but the pursuit for a thing to be the best thing. <laughs> okay, so I have a question in, um, from uh, the audience here. It's actually a multiple questions. So I'm going to pick apart one of them. They okay. asked, what are the best clones in Colorado? Which I think is too vast for you to answer. What I do want to answer is, how did you find the best quality in Colorado? Um, let's just say in that, like, you know, 2002 to 2012, time where where'd you get um, so i was in a back room on a message board that there was a group of guys all over the country slash world openly trading the most elite cuts on the planet at that time colorado may there might have been a couple maybe one or two other people with an og plant here there might have been Chem has been here. Chem weed has been here because because Chem Dog did a glass apprenticeship in Boulder. But um, yeah, so so the thing started coming to me, and then when the med scene opened up and there were some dispensaries, I hit up some of these guys that I got these clones from, and was like, "Hey man, I'm gonna sell them for ten bucks a piece to patients," and they're like, "Who?" I don't know about that. Not that they cared, but they're like, man, you're going to break yourself. That isn't how you control the market there, buddy. You got something. And uh, I was like, yeah. But people deserve to have the best weed. I give their best shot at growing it. And I don't think they're going to beat me. And if they do, they haven't beat me, then they leg me up because then I get to learn and, and, and level up. You know what I mean? So like, there's no losing and sharing this. And man, that, that act was not purposeful for anything other than that 
but it has served me very well. There have been several times through this industry where I would have been out. They weren't going to let me play. And one of those guys that I brought a tray of clones to made sure I got to be at the dance. You know what I mean? So uh, kind of cool. That's dope. I, I love that mindset. It's that like that abundance mindset, that collaboration. That's like, it's not just a, a zero sum perspective where if I share this, that means you're going to take from me and it's come back for you. Like, you know, multiple times later, I think a lot of people that are in the industry now that don't share that ethos, like strip away some of the authenticity and like the, the values from like the underground to the mainstream. And it's just kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it pains me to see companies operating where it just yeah. like, oh, mine, 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 mine. I want as much market share as possible. Like, fuck you. Anybody who's not us, fuck you. Yeah, and man, it used to be, you know, an us thing because it was a counterculture. <laughs> it still is. We're still treated the same way, you know, in a large respect. Cannabis users are still marginalized every day uh, all over the country less so here and i take it for granted sometimes but when i go east and openly smoke and people i know are smokers are terrified by that act uh i i then i'm like in a i'm like wow i forgot about that i forgot that people might like out you at the like stop talking to you at the office if then you're that you're a stoner <laughs> so we got a lot of work to do all right so let's switch gears again tell me about how you went from being a gracious clone sharing underground grower to um the concentrates we haven't even talked about concentrates like it's all a bit about growing and what was it yeah. So quick to the to the beginning, always making hash oil from the leftovers in my Florida grow, making really, really high quality hash oil in the late 80s, early 90s in Jamaica from flour. So at at an enormous scale. Uh, and it's like enormous scale that i have not done since um so always concentrates but around 2006 i had i, I was always involved in the glass community in colorado that's kind of where i landed was my was the grow community that i landed in was a bunch of glass bars and um a guy gave me a dab on a boro borosilicate dab rig with just the nail that he had made. Um, and I can't remember if it had a dome or not, but I was like, whoa, and I loved oil, but I never really had messed with it more than just a little here and there. I was smoking a lot of bubble hash at the time because I love hash, but uh, I was like, oh, that's a thing. That's the highest I've ever gotten on weed ever, and I've gotten to smoke some really cool weed, and uh, I took it. I, I, I took the pipe with me. I was like, buddy, I'm going to take this home. You're, you're, you're a glass blower. You, you can make yourself another one, and then uh, a couple weeks later, he taught me. He showed me wax. Somebody had showed him uh, how to, how to whip. And then I was like, oh, you can touch this and now package it. And at that time, uh, dispensaries were open in Colorado. There wasn't really licensing yet, but the, you know, Obama, the, the original uh, memos had come out. There were lawyers holding clinics on how to open a dispensary and it was going. So some friends of mine and I started to grow in Boulder and at the last minute when they made regulations we ended up with a MIP as 
the license. So we were the first OPC uh, uh, infused products manufacturer. So that's allowed to do, make hash, edibles, whatever. But if a, at that point, the way the regs were written was that a grow for that could only make concentrates. The flowers couldn't be sold. Uh, you had to remove the cannabinoids from the flowers and turn them into a product, which could include hash. And so that was the only license that we could land with. We literally, the ninth hour on August 13th, uh, 2010, I think it was, we landed with these guys. Uh, anyway, so, so I started doing it and then um, was working on my original thing was that I wanted to freeze the plants to be able to sift them so that we could make BHO from the sift and use less butane. And it didn't really work. And I parked it. And then I later revisited it. But that was the early where I was coming at to do live resin. I was really trying to use less solvent was the, was the impetus of it in the beginning. Um, because there weren't closed loop extraction and it just wasn't, wasn't a great thing. Uh, when. Wait, hold on, Bill. You, you were making butane hash, not closed loop. I mean. Whew. Yeah. Whew. Well known. Uh, there weren't closed loops. And, and, and right. literally, man, I, uh, I'm a super lucky guy to be my age and not have had an accident. And, uh, you know, my, my, my earliest mentor was, was a chemist. We had, we had a still in scale running hundreds of pounds in Jamaica. So I've been with scale solvent. Um, but no excuse for that. But it's also like America not admitting to how America became America. I mean, the hash makers that have been in the game that long open blasted, unfortunately. That's um, wild. I, like that makes my heart rate go up thinking about it. The emo. So, so I ran the second Emotech, which was the first registered closed loop BHO machine in existence but i was in there on the very second iteration of that machine and you know uh live resin couldn't have happened without it uh because that's when I, the name happened and, and, and it was something that was not doable um or safe but i was sitting there looking at that machine talking to giddy up the founder of emotech and I, and I was like, hey, man, can I freeze this thing? I saw that it had a temperature rating on it. And he was like, I don't know why you would. And then I explained the whole thing to him. And uh, we talked the owner of a cut above into giving us some trim that he actually had frozen and he had slated to give the nicotine. And we, we blasted it. And that was the first time. Didn't really work out that time. The first time it worked, really worked, was that, you know, the first runs for TR. Yeah, scientific, you know. But the, from the second that that worked, we dropped the first batch, uh, the very first run of live resin like that, that came out, which was literally the second time I did it in a closed loop. We entered into the secret cup and won Connoisseur's Choice. And that was also the first time I had I ever lost a garden in my life, man. It, it literally, live resin took my life over. My plants died. What do you? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? So you just started focusing purely on? I just had so much going on immediately from like that second, and um, you know, working as a consultant in the industry, not having a badge, having an agreement with with ownership that they could revoke at any second because I didn't have a badge. So I literally started working like this 50 hour workday thing that I, that I was pretty famous for in the early days of just like working until I couldn't. And then I would go to the hotel at the end of the street, shower, sleep, 
and go right back to the lab. But I wouldn't even get three blocks away, man. They, they, they were uh, paying me well and it was legal tax, tax money. And I couldn't believe that they were letting me do it. So I couldn't stop. <laughs> you know, I just literally couldn't stop. And throughout this whole thing, when it gets tough in the lab or in the garden, man, I just am like, holy shit, they're letting us do this. And then I get a big smile and back to light step and going after it, you know. But it's not legal. They're only letting us do it. And they're more really right now letting their buddies get rich on it. But but we'll get to it. It's, it's step by step by step. You know, so all right. Um I'm going to, we only got a few more minutes. I'm going to open it up to the audience in just a minute here. Um, but I have intentionally just spent more time hearing about your story than hearing about like the tricks to going from underground to above ground. Cause I think your story is just so powerful and there's so much to learn from it. Um, but just for the people in our audience that have been operating underground, they do want to operate in um, well, some of them, want to operate in the regulated market, right? Be, there's benefits to that. You feel a little bit mm -hmm. more secure, uh, probably a lot more secure. You probably don't have as high a margin, but um, we haven't even gotten to the part of your story where you're working for multiple different operators, right? Like you've worked for um, Quest, Acreage, a bunch of really, really, really solid brands um, have come through you. And I'm just kind of curious about like, what have you gained in doing that? And what have you lost operating in the legal game? Great, great, great question. So I have gained uh, the ability to sleep through the night, which literally didn't start happening for me until 2011. Uh, one thing about going through that whole experience you hear every sound, man, for a long time. You know what I mean? You're never really at rest. There's an alertness that uh, is traumatizing. And just from going through, I imagine, war, from any, anything like that where, where your reality gets shattered in a fraction of a second and it's violent. Um, so I gained sleep. I gained the ability to be out. And I'm out, you know what I mean? Like, I don't hide anything about weed anymore. I refuse to. My, my kids' teachers know what I do for a living. Um, my mom, who still doesn't get it, but she's 82, you know what I mean? And she had to read about my weed career on the front page of the newspaper for the first time. And you know what I mean? So uh, I gained all of that. Uh, and and more people are smoking better weed than ever before it used to be like you had to know a guy that was really a thing to even have access to something like some of these strains that we that we that are commonplace uh like the the you know PK or whatever, you, used to, you had to know that guy for five years before he'd smoke that weed with you. Now anybody can smoke it. That's cool. There's not as much excellent weed because it's harder to do uh, because of scale and price. There's no... Uh, rules yet amongst the standard business rules apply where like man you better pay attention because you're gonna you, you you can be taken advantage of contracts are only your friend if you read them and understand them and you know know your stuff uh i read duff mckagan's uh the the bass player for guns and roses biography and he was like man the only reason why I have any money and all these other, you know, most of my buddies don't is, is like, I learned everything I could about the business side of this. And um, so that I could understand and navigate that. And you know, a lot of cannabis veterans will complain that the business side and the money side doesn't understand cannabis, which is true. But as a veteran, 
coming into the business world. We're actually coming into their world with our thing. And it's on us to be able to show up and master a, a office suite on a computer, be on time and do normal rules of business and respond to emails, all the stuff that can be really a challenge for somebody who's not had to answer to anybody. I'll say that's the, the thing. And, and just keep showing up, man. They told me to go home at uh, Mindful. The CEO told me to go home. And then the other two owners were like, just don't let her see you here. And I was like, cool. And I kept coming. You know what I mean? <laughs> so just keep coming. And then the last thing, um, and this is important because they're to me, and I have no problem with black market. I have no problem with gray market. And I, and I have no problem with the regulated market. But if you're in a license, in a regulated market, do yourself a favor. Follow the rules. 100%. Be ahead of them in compliance all the way. And that is where I've won. I know compliance. I've stayed on it. I've been ahead of it. And um, when there's ever been anything that was weird, I engaged whoever that regulatory body was or whoever I needed to immediately with 100% transparency and had documentation, which sounds like boring stuff, right? But that's the, that's the real, real. And, and you, you have some luck, keep showing up, follow the rules. You got a chance, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I think just knowing you and in hearing your story, those things resonate so well to me because it's like, I know none of that came natural to you. You built skills for 20, 30 years, and then you had to learn these new skills to play the game by the rules. And I just, I want to echo that. If you're not going to play by the rules, don't even try. Don't right? You might as well keep a solid operation underground and not pay taxes. If you're going to do it halfway, you're worse off. Yeah, I would agree. Um, early friends in medical in Colorado who, who didn't like quite figure out how to do it right in the beginning were like, damn, this is the best way in the world to knock zeros off your net worth that I've ever found. Like trying to quasi be legal will just make you impoverished. And, and you know what I mean? There, there's, a, there's a willingness to be able to have money that you get to keep and spend and be part of your community and hold your head up high in that way. Not that them saying it's okay is uh, makes it okay, but it sure is nice to know they're not going to take your money and get a tax return and to not have to lie about anything in my life anymore. Like, you know, being a weed car means you're a liar in, a, in an underground world. And I didn't like that at all. I didn't like having to lie about where I was going, what I was doing, not telling people's travel plans, all the things. So that's a lot of gifts of, of, of a new freedom. Well, uh, I do want to bring in at least one of the people from our Kim, or I'm sorry, I'll let you pronounce your name if I got it wrong. Um, I'm gonna ask you to come up here. Let's see here. Well, is Jacoby stuck? Yeah, I think Jacoby stuck. Hold on, let me see if I can get. And there she goes. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? I can. Well, first, I want to say I'm so um, grateful to hear your story because I absolutely did not know that that was happening. And the fact that, and if I could be very transparent, because I feel like we're all uh, friends on this, uh, on this line, the fact that you're a white guy that 
had these experiences is God smacking to me. Um, my question, Bill, is as I, I'm a cannabis accountant and um, sometimes the conversations around 280E is mm-hmm. difficult because people can't wrap their heads around, you know, having to pay at least 70% of federal taxes. Um, how did, how did in the early stages, how did you deal with, uh, taxes and accounting and bookkeeping? Uh, huge challenge. And I really didn't know what to do and where to turn to and my lack of trust and all of the things got me in quite a bunch of, I I, I have a pretty decent tax bill that I'm making a payment on every month. I'll be honest with you. I didn't know how to do it. And um, I think one of the coolest things about the equity programs and things that are going on is access to accounting. But uh, so 280E didn't affect, doesn't affect consulting because I, ha- I, I, I don't have the kind of write-offs and things that, that, that really kill you in a, in a retail situation. And the early people navigated 280E through real estate, which is kind of why the access has been so tough. It's really hard to make money in a retail situation that you don't own the real estate on, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. You, you answered my question. So as, a, as an accountant in this space, is there anything, any type of um, tips that you can give me to help your, um, you know, people that are going in and help them understand the consequences when it comes to accounting and taxes and just keeping good records? You have got to be um, meticulous with your taxes above and beyond the way any normal business would be. All of the groups that I've worked with have been audited uh, at one point or another that I've been in business long enough to have been audited. And um, you really have to be making all of your decisions based on how 280 will affect you as an owner for sure and that's something that you can advise them on more correctly than i can but knowing how to grow sell package market cannabis is has nothing to do with knowing how to get to keep any of that money because of the tax structure and it's really uh, uh, tenuous for smaller groups that uh, that don't have ways like real estate um, to be able to to go through the taxes. Uh. Yeah, I'll I'll just add on to that. Um, that two eighty e is a bitch. <laughs> like <if> you, <laughs> like it sucks if you're in cannabis. I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, I I don't know what city or or state you're in, but let's definitely connect after. With everything that's going on in the East Coast, especially in New York and New Jersey, a little bit of you know Pennsylvania and, and everything over there, we have a ton of people in our community that are ramping up, right? From really small businesses that want to be co-ops and craft licenses to some people in our network that are going for you know big manufacturing licenses in, in like upstate New York. And they're all looking for um, all of the professional services that are going to help them be successful. And something about people on the East Coast more than any place I've ever been is you want people from your neighborhood. You want people that you can trust. You want people that have been here that that are authentic. And so um, happy to connect you with, with groups as they start to come through our community. But taxes is probably one of the most important, taxes and accounting in general are one of the most important things for groups that have been doing it all on their own in cash for so long. That's a, that's a tough learning curve. So there's a ton of value I'm sure you could bring. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're actually in the Bronx. Oh, let's so, go. Yes. I want to also um, interject that it would also be helpful for you to have your clients structure their companies in ways where, for example, on the machine side, it's a completely separate company where you're actually almost, you're basically leasing um, the machines 
for your cannabis to plant touching thing. So those are, there's different types of things you can do, but trying to keep everything non-plant touching that isn't plant touching in your operation um, as a completely different entity is, will be very helpful because since it's not plant touching, those two ADE laws are not applicable. They're like normal business. So right. The pick and shovel plays are definitely going to be where the biggest runs are, especially on the East Coast. Yep. I have a question um, for you, Bill. Okay. Um, so you've seen the underground market, you've seen the gray market, you've seen the legal market. Um, what are some characteristics of groups that you think, like of the successful ones across all different markets? What are some of the characteristics that you've seen that you know, like this group is going to be successful in what they do? Um, so passion for the plant combined with um, some, some business know-how that there's definitely, and even black market, the guys that I ran with, you know, they, were, they had Excel <laughs> then. <laughs> it, it was not, this is not, you know, tight ship, it, it goes a long way, right? So, um, but when people care about their employees, their customers, their plants, their community in a full spectrum way, like to me, that's what full spectrum is, right? It is like hitting it on every, every way that you can find a way to hit and be in that constant life cycle improvement of, hey, can we could, can we do, how can we do this better tomorrow? And, and, and um, focusing on getting base runs every day uh, rather than trying to hit home runs, right? If you get everybody in play, take care of your people. People are stoked to come to the workplace. You set a super high standard for how the product's handled, no matter the price point. If you honor the product correctly, there's a whole thing that channels through to the end user in my experience that's, that's real and tenable. And people like can pull fake brands out that are, that are insincere pretty quickly. It, and even with sincere people behind them, um, they don't land the same way. No, I don't know. Did that answer that at all? Like, yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, as East Coast comes on board, there's just going to be a lot more like money, 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 money brands coming in and money, 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 money corporations coming in. So I guess, you know, for our audience, you know, who are trying to get into the industry on the legal side, the question was related to like, what should they, they be looking for? Right. You know, so should they be it's a choice with the way the East Coast is coming on. 98% of the players coming into this are looking at exit already and they're not in. Okay. So are you, as your business, looking to take a ride and go on an exit? That means a lot of different things. But that means that you're going to play with money guys and be working in a pro forma world, 100% different expectation. And if, if you want to be a legacy player in 20 years as a craft person, then my highest recommendation is to focus on organic growth, take the least amount of money that you have to raise to get in the game do be lean care about your product and your people keep people don't let there be turnover be the reason why your weed sucks it, you know it, it, i can't emphasize how much it has to do with the relationships of the people growing this cannabis and the entity um yeah that that would be the the that's how that is how I'm moving forward. I've done big, small, medium. And now I really look forward to a really s small operation that I can affect on a daily basis and really eke little bits of quality out here and there and try to set a standard. I mean, I think it's just super impressive that you've created over 200 SKUs of products in over 21 markets. 
are you taking, you know, are you consulting? Are you take, are you open to working with different groups still? Uh, I, I am. Um, and, I, and I have for the last eight months just been kind of home really, um, you know, one of the costs of this industry for me personally has been like my kids are, are, are grown out. Uh, you know, they're not two and five, they're 13 and nine. And I missed it. I missed, uh, I missed it. And uh, so I've been trying to make up a little ground and find a way to be here with them every day, but still be in industry. And I, I got something up my sleeve for Colorado uh, that's coming. And uh, hope to be participating in some some things in California that that will be some some equity focused media and things. Just getting attention to that. Hey, there are legacy people out here who are second, third generation that are behind some of these things that you might not know about. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I got going, um, and I'm looking forward to. Love it, Bill. My guy, I appreciate you uh, making the time to thanks, guys. come with us. Yeah, it was really great to hear your story. Like I said, I've known you for a bit, so I've known about your story. I even had a prep meeting with you, so I knew a little bit more about your story. And today I still learn more about it, and it's just so impactful, and I'm glad you were able to share it with us. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Instagram is kind at kind Bill, right? Yep. All right, some tricks up his sleeve for the future. It's uh, coming. Sorry. Lulu, what's up? I said yeah, something's I wanted... coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to drop in um, for Corvain Cooper, the GoFundMe page. So yeah. if people have an opportunity, please just donate. Um, and then really excited for next week's episode for Chronicles from the Underground. We're going to be featuring um, six men. So if you like high maintenance the show, we have an OG a bicycle uh, delivery from Chicago and New York City. Um, he's going to be sharing his story. So hope to see you next week. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining uh, on Zoom and on YouTube. Bill, once again, we appreciate